Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thank you all for joining us uh, today for our program, Navigating the New Cyber Incident Reporting Requirements, hosted by AIS Network and Williams Mullet. Uh, my name is Chris McDonald, and I serve as Director of Government Relations at Williams Mullen. I'm joined here today by my colleague, Patrick Cushing, the Vice Chair of our Government Relations section. Um, Patrick and I are pleased to moderate today's webinar. Today, we're joined by three speakers who will provide really actionable information and insight into new legislation and how to respond to cybersecurity incidents. First up, we'll hear from Jeremy Bennett with the Virginia Association of Counties, or VACO. Jeremy has served as Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at the Virginia Association of Counties since 2018. In this capacity, he advocates for local government priorities in the fields of K-12 education, commerce and labor, and general government, which includes cybersecurity. Prior to his service with VACO, Jeremy was a lobbyist with the Virginia School Boards Association and a congressional staffer. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that Jeremy and I were colleagues at VACO for several years. So Jeremy, it's great to have uh, you back and be working with you today. Next up, we have Eddie McAndrew, the COO and CIO of AIS Network, a Richmond-based information technology services and consulting company recently named to the Inc. 5000 list of the fastest growing private companies for a second year in a row. Eddie is a seasoned IT professional with over 25 years of information technology and government, uh, governance risk and compliance consulting experience in both the public and private sectors. He's a certified information systems security professional and has exposure to cybersecurity from a range of perspectives, including work as a CISO and a cybersecurity consultant. And last, but certainly not least, Kevin Pomfret is the co-chair of the data protection and cybersecurity practice here at Williams Mullen. Kevin advises clients on a wide range of data protection, privacy, and cybersecurity measures. In this capacity, he regularly drafts privacy statements and internal policies and procedures, negotiates privacy and information security contract provisions, and assists clients and organizations that have suffered data breaches and other cyber incidents. So Jeremy, Eddie, Kevin, thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you Chris. Welcome to be here. Before we kick off our program, I do have a quick uh, few housekeeping items to go over. At any point during the presentation, you may submit questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will turn to questions at the end of the presentation. If you're having any audio or technical problems, please use that same Q&A button and our helpful marketing team will get those issues resolved for you. And finally, no need to write down everything you see on the slides today. Everyone will receive a copy of this presentation uh, by email later today. So without further ado, let's get started. Jeremy, why don't you kick things off for us? Great, well, thank you, Chris, for that uh, lovely introduction. And it's uh, great to be working with you again on this issue. And I uh, also would want to thank AIS Networks for their partnership with VACO and uh, William uh, Mullen for uh, inviting me and also hosting this event. So um, I thought what we'd do to start off is just kind of give some uh, context about recent cybersecurity incidents before we get into the context of how the legislation uh, that was introduced and enacted um, this past session, how that really impacts uh, some of our members and local government and really just public bodies across the Commonwealth. So, um, you know, going into the 2022 General Assembly session, uh, the issue of cybersecurity was really kind of front and center with a lot of legislators and just the state in general. Uh, as many of you may recall, in December um, of 2021, there was a ransomware attack on the Virginia General Assembly that basically shut down the Division of Legislative Services uh, a month before the session was to start. And for those of you like me who deal with a lot of advocacy and lobbying, you know that that is kind of a critical time for legislators and their staff uh, in preparing for, you know, debate and discussion and enactment of all these bills. So the inability to access that system to do those, um, those tasks really kind of uh, scared everyone and really, again, put that issue uh, front and center. Um, now, of course, that wasn't the first time that there's been a major cyber incident. Um, and, you know, we talk about local government and cyber attacks. Um, one of the biggest ones I'd like to just cite and the biggest in terms of its impact was the 2019 Baltimore ransomware attack. And uh, that was a variant of uh, the Robin Hood ransomware. And basically, it shut down um, all the city servers and really um, impacted the ability of a local government, in this case, the city of Baltimore, to basically do the business of governing. And uh, whether that's, you know, 
know, city employees having access to their email, uh, being able to issue water bills, real estate sales, all that was impacted. And um, it really was, you know, kind of a, a perfect storm of factors that led to it where there were bad IT practices um, and also a failure of the city to allocate adequate funding for cyber cybersecurity insurance. And, and we might touch on that, that issue a little bit later, but um, that's part of this larger conversation. And uh, really what ended up happening was um, the city basically had to spend $18 million to kind of rebuild their system. And uh, as of even April of this year, uh, they're still three years out from this initial incident. They're still dealing with the consequences of that. Uh, some of their teachers are having really trouble accessing some of their insurance uh, information and their ability to, to you know, manage that. So. You know, that's one notable incident, but it's part of a larger trend in cybersecurity where, you know, we've seen in the past three years, you know, 100% increase in the number of cyber uh, security incident claims. And, uh, you know, just even last year, risk insurers uh, paid out on over eight, you know, 8,100 different uh, cybersecurity claims. So this is definitely a pressing issue. And, um, you know, if we could advance to the next slide, um, that's kind of the, the, where we were going into the session. So uh, there were two bills introduced, uh, HB 1290 and SB 764, uh, one by Delegate uh, Cliff Hayes, who used to be the former chair of the uh, Communications Technology and Innovation Committee, and then the other by uh, Senator, Senator Barker who's chair of the uh, General Laws and Technology Committee in the Senate. And um, basically the original legislation, and it's linked in here if you want to actually read the text, it would require every public body in the Commonwealth to report all known incidents that threaten the security of the Commonwealth's data or communications or results in the exposure of protected uh, data uh, and all other incidents compromising the security of a public body's uh, IT systems with a potential to cause major disruptions or to normal activities. So, you know, when we talk about public bodies, uh, we're talking about political subdivisions, so local governments, school boards, uh, but we're also talking about uh, executive branch agencies, uh, legislative commissions, uh, universities. I mean, basically, we're just covering the whole gamut. And um, this was legislation that um, was brought forward uh, at the request of uh, the Virginia IT Agency, or as you all know better, uh, VITA, and uh, supported by Governor Youngkin and his administration. And uh, really, again, it was trying to, and it is trying to capture a picture of all cybersecurity incidents that are impacting public bodies in Virginia so that we can get a better sense of, you know, what, what the major threats are out there and uh, what those disruptions are doing to, uh, to, to local governing bodies and, and other, other public bodies. So uh, if we go to the next slide. So um, it originally, the legislation originally required that uh, these incidents be reported directly to VITA. Um, we were very fortunate to work with the bill patrons and to work with VITA uh, to amend the legislation to change that reporting requirement to go through the Virginia Fusion Center, uh, which is run by the Virginia State Police. And uh, for those of you familiar with the Virginia Fusion Center, um, there are protections from Freedom of Information FOIA uh, uh, requests that protect the confidentiality Kind of confidentiality and immunity um, of that information. So uh, when you talk with cybersecurity experts and uh, cyber insurers, you know, protecting that critical data and that information is vital to how you respond to a cyber incident. So um, having that FOIA protections is very good. And you know, we appreciate that the, uh, the, the bill patrons um, and VITA uh, were able to compromise on that. Uh, there was um, the, the legislation as it currently stands, it does require that an incident be reported uh, within 24 hours of initial discovery. Um, we, in local government, we you know, tried to get a little bit more flexibility in terms of uh, the reporting requirement, but you know, unfortunately it did end up being that 24. And uh, it, the legislation was well received by the legislature. Um, as you can see, the, the vote margins in the House and the Senate, there were only seven, seven legislators who objected to this. So uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, and part of part of that requirement in the, the incident reporting, and I know um, Eddie's going to talk about that actual process, uh, but the bill did require that the uh, CIO of VITA, uh, Bob Osmond, that they review, convene a work group to review current cybersecurity reporting and information sharing practice is, and report that information to the General Assembly. And it's part of that work group, which I was fortunate enough to sit on, and uh, I know Eddie attended as well, and among others in local government and other public bodies, um, you know, we met about three or four times and we're really able to kind of give our input and feedback on the reporting website and to, again, minimize the burden on public bodies, but still, you know, 
create a system that's in the spirit of the legislation and uh, also allows the uh, VITA to kind of, and the state to kind of get a better picture of uh, what's going on out there. And uh, I, I just mentioned, I'll mention briefly before um, turning it over to Eddie, uh, there is another work group um, that is gonna be convened by VITA looking at cybersecurity. And this is, um, it's, this is budget language uh, that requires uh, the creation of a, a work group with representatives from the state and local government and other entities um, to basically determine a process for the allocation of uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funds, IIJA, the Federal Infrastructure um, Act, uh, about uh, you know $25 million in funding that will help bolster local and other systems um, and cybersecurity. So that, that work group hasn't been announced yet, but um, that's something just for you know our members to keep in mind going forward. But um, Chris, that, that kind of just is the, the overview of how we got to where we are. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Eddie uh, about you know what the actual reporting requirements are and that, that process, but I uh, hope that's helpful just giving us some context in terms of where, where we got to where we are. Next slide. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Eddie McAndrew, uh, CIO, CIO at uh, AIS Network. And I'd also like to thank William Smallin for hosting um, this session and for providing the opportunity to really reach out to the community to, to understand what we need to do to work together and how we can leverage this process. The question that I've most often encountered as it relates to this um, legislation is, should our report it rises to the level of significance um, that would merit reporting. And, and if you look at the, the legislation threatening the security commonwealth data, the potential to cause major disruption, let's face it, I mean, in the end, there are gonna be a lot of instances where it's gonna be a judgment call. Um, but a couple of things that I would point out, one, it's confidential. As Jeremy noted, um, the freedom of the FOIA requests, the freedom of information requests, are protected vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Fusion Center. Um, and you know, secondly, it, it provides tracking data that really is um, for the benefit of all. One of the challenges that we in the cyber community face um, is the reluctance on the part of organizations that have an incident to report that or to let it be known. Um, for fear of uh, the problems that it might cause. And, and so what results is a, a dearth of information in terms of really understanding what's happening within the community, what, what the cyber uh, profiles looking like and, and, and you know, information that will help all people across the, the, the community to proactively take action that will uh, be to the benefit of all. So um, my inclination, my recommendation is when in doubt, report, you know, take advantage of what's been put in place to really help everybody. Um, working together is going to provide the best defense for everyone. So my suggestion is take advantage of the process and, and report when in doubt. Next slide. So when you go to uh, the report website, one of the things that I would recommend you do right off the bat is look at the frequently asked questions, the FAQs. Um, the link is on the, on the, the deck below, and, and this, as noted, will be sent out. But it really provides a lot of great information um, that will help you through this process. What's a cybersecurity incident? There are some examples there. What should be reported and when um, are they the reports confidential? Will I be contacted? So that I would take a little bit of time. It's only a few minutes to read through the FAQs, and, and I think that'll really position you to to report with ease. Next slide. So logistics of reporting an incident. One of the things that I think has really come through loud and clear from a design concept, um, and, and Jeremy alluded to this, is uh, making it easy for the organizations to report an incident. The link is there, go check it out. Um, first, you're gonna look at, you know, is it executive branch or other organizations? The, the, the legislation applies to all public bodies. So most of the entries are, are buttons or drop-down lists again, to minimize the time and effort to report something. And there really is only a minimal 
amount of information that's required to be able to report the incident. And some of these examples are on here. So, I mean, the bottom line is it's easy to su submit an incident. So again, back to really um, working to make the cyber and the IT and organizations across the board more able to respond to track and really put in place proactive action around cybersecurity. This is a great tool to help make that happen. Next slide. So I wanted to leave you with uh, a couple of other great sources of information related to cybersecurity. First, um, you'll note is the, the Fusion Center, which is um, linked to, but partly separate than the, um, the reporting site. Um, it was a collaborative effort that was put in place after 9-11 as, as a way to really close the intelligence gaps. It's, it's a fantastic resource. Um, I highly suggest you take a look at that. Um, it'll really help you understand what's going on within the state and across the, across the country. Another one is the uh, CISA, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. This is a federal agency focused on cyber. Um, there's a lot of great information on there, tips and blogs. And um, as a CISO, I, I used it to provide monthly tips to, to my organization um, as, a, as a really a security awareness tool. But it also provides information around um, the latest threats um, and really uh, has, a, has a, a pulse on what's happening within the cyber world. And then finally, and, and there are a plethora of different resources uh, for cyber out there, but the Center for Internet Security is a really great uh, resource for helping you to build your program, to maintain your program, to understand what the best practices are within the cyber community and within your IT and cyber uh, program to position yourself with a strong, a sound cybersecurity posture. So I would highly recommend you take a look at these. So if you have any questions either now or later, feel free to contact me. Feel free to reach out to us at AIS Network. We're more than happy to help. Again, thanks for the opportunity to William Small and, and Jeremy, it's been great working with you at VACO. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Kevin Pomp. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, next slide, please. So first of all, I just want to build on what Jeremy and, and Eddie have said. I, I think that you know, they've provided a really good background in terms of how we got here and what's, what's in the legislation and, and why it's important outside of what the law requires, but also important to, to report incidents so that there can become a body of knowledge and, and we can be better prepared as a, as a commonwealth, as a, as a country. Um, to be able to deal with these issues because they're not going away. They're only increasing and, and sharing knowledge is important. Um, I'm only going to touch on a couple of things that, you know, as a lawyer, as I look at the, the language that sort of jumped out at me, and, and these aren't meant as criticisms, but just sort of things that if I was counseling an organization dealing with this, you know, uh, what some of the things I would point out. And, and the first one is the, the, the public body shall report um, incidents that threaten the security. And I, I, I focus on the threatened because I, I think that's a, a term that is very, or could be interpreted very broadly. And what that means and how that should be applied, I think will be a little bit, um, you know, could be difficult as a lawyer if, when you get facts, specific fact patterns in terms, is this a threat? Is a disgruntled employee leaving, saying something, sending an email? Is that, a, is that an incident that threatens the security? Um, so, and I'll mention this throughout, I think the, the, the best way to deal with this is as you develop your, your incident response policies and procedures to just try to come up with a definition or, or a sense of who's gonna be responsible for defining what that term means so that you can have a, a, a standard response throughout and, and you know internally how you're gonna handle situations. Cause I don't think there's a, a right or wrong answer necessarily, but I do think you want to be consistent in your approach and, and transparent. Um, so that something does happen, there's no uncertainty. Um, the other the other part of that section that um, I thought was interesting was um, it, exposure of um, systems, of, exposure of data that's protected by federal or state law. 
that's a pretty broad definition. Um, so for instance, Virginia has trade secret law. Um, federal, there are federal laws requiring the protection of um, uh, unclassified but controlled information. And I'm just wondering if organizations are gonna necessarily know all the different things within there, all the systems and data within their organization that are protected by all the different types of federal or state law. So again, what I would suggest is as you're developing your incident response policies to, to do a, a, you know, a inventory of what laws might be applicable to your situation, where that data is, who's storing it, who has access to it, so that if something were to happen, you'd be able to know what, what does and doesn't apply. And then the third piece um, is just because of the broad definition of public bodies, which you know, I think is fairly, fairly standard, um, it, but it does come to mind, or for me anyways, how do you deal with the private sector citizen members on these boards? And if, for instance, there was a fishing incident with an individual um, in, on his or her um, personal email account that somehow led to disclosure of information that might be associated with a public body, what's the responsibility for the public body to report that incident? And how do you notify the individuals that they should let you know, right? And, and, and what responsibility do, do they have? And do you include that now in your training and your responsibilities of, for private sector or citizen members to come on board and participate in these things? Again, I think it's important because we're all connected, but it is something that sort of jumped out at me in terms of thinking through what, what you're gonna be doing, how are you gonna to respond to this and making sure that organizations have consistent and transparent policies and procedures in place as these incidents arise. Because there will be questions, particularly in any new law, but particularly something around cybersecurity, there will be questions that arise and they will be you know, very fact dependent, but you wanna have some basis to make those decisions so that you can be consistent. Uh, and that's it for me. So next slide, I think we got a question slide. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for the information um, this morning. Um, a lot of really inf interesting uh, information, a lot of good insights into kind of where we were and why we've gotten to where we are. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions uh, and we've gotten a couple in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll throw them both out uh, now. I think one is probably best suited for Jeremy. We did get a question about where does risk insurance fall uh, into kind of all of this. And then a second question um, that maybe uh, 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 Eddie might be best at answering about, um, do we have any recommendations for assessing your organization um, or any services to conduct testing or probing? Um, so I'll let you all take those. Great. Well, thank you, Chris. I'll just start off on, you know, touching on risk insurance and then I'll turn things over to Eddie to address the other question. And, um, you know, really just want to, Kevin did a great job in terms of um, laying out the considerations that you should be thinking about when you're, you know, responding to a cyber incident. But, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of our members um, already have risk insurance policies in place that specifically deal with cybersecurity. So uh, when you're thinking about your response and you're in doubt, um, review your existing policies and certainly uh, feel free to contact your risk insurers. I know a lot of our members are very fortunate to have uh, a relationship with our partner at Vacorp and uh, they do a great cybersecurity response um, program. So, um, you know, if you, you do have a cybersecurity response, make sure you're touching base with either Vacorp or another risk insurer, because uh, the last thing you want to do is, um, and your, you know, good intentions to respond to an incident and report that incident, uh, you don't want to risk jeopardizing your co coverage. Uh, so, you know, you know just, just make sure that you're, uh, you're, you're in, in line with those policies and you're talking with your risk insurers. Yeah, so um, in terms of your question, do you have any recommendations for assessing your organization? Um, sure, the, one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, risk assessments can be done at the enterprise level, um, at the system level, at the application level. I think it, it, you know, one of the questions you're gonna ask yourself is, do we do it ourselves? Do we bring in a third party? It's great to bring in a third party. Certainly we at AIS Network do uh, risk assessments at any of those levels. Um, and one of the things I would look to if you're going to bring in a third party, you know, have them help you to understand the process, right? Work through your risk assessment with them or go out to uh, the CIS that has the Center for Internet uh, Security has information on doing risk assessments. And you can certainly look at NIST 853 
which will provide a catalog of areas to look across at. In terms of services to conduct testing, um, really uh, what, we all, what we do on the systems that we host and, and really is really the best practice is to do vulnerability scanning monthly. Right. And, and, you know, one of the most common um, vectors of attack is systems that are out of date, uh, drivers that are not updated, uh, patched uh, appropriately, OS levels out. Um, so you'll find those things through vulnerability testing or scanning, and, and that'll give you some good results. And then you should really look to do penetration testing, ideally once in a while with a third party, but do penetration testing at least annually. Um, if not biannually. And of course, it depends on, you know, uh, the level of uh, risk in your data itself. So if it's sensitive data, then you, you want to have a higher level. Certainly feel free to reach out to me. I, we recently at AIS did a, a, a webinar um, with the uh, Insurance Association in Virginia, and um, it goes into some good detail on whether you want to do it internally or externally and how to approach that. So if anyone is interested, I'd be happy to send along that deck, which details information along with that. And Paige, it's it's good to see you're out there live and kicking in. Thanks for the, the plug on the, on the CISA website. I was going to say, yeah, Paige Brothers has commented that the CISA website has an incredible template to get people started on developing their plan. Our agency found the CISA free resource is very helpful. So a good plug for that. Um, we are just about out of time, um, so I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today and thank everyone for, uh, for tuning in your questions. If we did not get to your questions, um, we will reach out to you directly uh, with more information, um, but thank you all. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at another one of these. Please don't hesitate to reach out with further questions, um, and we're happy to help, so thank you so much.